one of these questions. A couple of things right quick. Some of you have asked, because I mentioned it last year in Joplin, how my wife is. Those of you who were not there, didn't hear it, and so are not necessarily involved. Some of you know that she's not been well for quite a number of years. Last year at this time, she had uh, just uh, gotten a good case of Bell's palsy, and if you do not know what that is, I'm not going to tell you, but it is disfiguring face-wise. Uh, we were, uh, to put clearly, quite discouraged because of a number of things, but because of some of you and others likened to you who prayed, I know you did, you didn't tell me, but I know you did about that matter, I can tell you this evening she has much improved uh, over several years now. Uh, she's much better than she's been for several years. And so just just want you to know that. Uh, I see my sis St. back here. Didn't know she was here. But but uh, Colleen can tell you, that's one of my sisters at least, that Wanda, that's my wife's name, is much better than she has been for years. Uh, I've repeated myself, and I'm sorry for that. I didn't mean necessarily to do that. But for me, it is, it is uh, in some ways an affirmation of the fact that prayer does do things. Uh, maybe you didn't think I needed to know that. <laughs> maybe you thought I already did, but, but sometimes if your faith is like mine, uh, you, you say, God, what are you doing for me now? And uh, I'll admit to that every once in a while, to God, what are you doing now? And so uh, there's that angle to it. And so she was not, she's not able to come for a long session like this. Uh, she could come for an evening or something, but I came this morning and she would not be able to do that. But uh, she's outside watering the flowers and, and uh, taking mostly care of the house and things of that nature, none of which had she been able to do in years prior to this. And so I just passed that. That's all I need to say there. Then on a little different subject, uh, it related to the song that these two ladies sang so very well, Sweet Will of God. I first heard that song... Uh, Seth by a fellow named Dean Carey at Ozark Bible College many years, the first time I'd ever heard that song. Uh, it, it struck me at the time because like Seth, I knew Dean. And I, every time I hear that song, I think of that man. And what that, that he meant that song. And I know it didn't come easy for him. I dare say it does not come easy now to him. But he meant that song. And I just think of that when I sweet will of God. Shut in with God. Huh, that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Yes, <clears throat> an anchor for our soul. In this audience, I assume, I do not have to prove that we have a soul. So the purpose of this discussion then, as you may see, is to discuss God's anchor and our soul in relationship to that anchor. And then to anticipate the conclusion, because you already know where we're going, God does have an anchor for our soul. His name is Jesus. And as the Scripture will say many, many times over, in one way or another, that if my soul is rooted in and built upon that person named Jesus, I am safe Evermore. In fact, that's what the text we're going to read this evening says. And in a very real sense of the term, which most people, I suspect, miss, we then can be once in grace, always in grace. We can start and finish without any doubt. We, we can do that. Sometimes I think, and if you excuse this, just off the side here, I've been thinking a lot about marriage. <laughs> well, okay, for a number of reasons, but in any case, over in the congregation where I serve, uh, we had a couple just kind of disintegrate about three months ago or so. It, it, it struck all of us because we at least suspected it. You know, sometimes you can kind of figure what's going to happen, and other times you smash the roof falls in, you didn't know it's coming down. And we have amongst ourselves over there thought a whole lot about marriage, but in thinking about marriage, uh, the, the current climate in which we live in these United States says plan A is to get married and plan B is to get a divorce. And Jesus said it so very well 2,000 years ago. In the beginning, it was not that way. That's Matthew 19. It was not planned that way. We were not created that way. We were created to start and finish both in respect to God and in a marriage related. That's the way we were created. The norm is to start and finish. Amen. 
I thought it quite a little bit. They're going to Wichita. This couple is $100 a shot on Monday morning at 7 o'clock to get counseling. And I got to thinking about the people in the congregation. I and my wife have been married 44 years. There are a number there have been married longer than we have. There are others on down the line. We have four or 500 years of experience sitting right there in the congregation to say, look, you haven't done anything, haven't experienced anything, won't that we haven't. There's something in the Bible, isn't there, that no temptation has taken you but what? Such as that there hasn't been any test in their life that some of the rest of us haven't had. In fact, no matter, I know for sure that that's true. Well, what I'm trying to say is that in respect to a marriage relationship as well as a salvation relationship, God created us to start and finish. It may not happen. I know some of you. I know some of you very well here. That there, there are stories in my own family. There are sad stories. I'm aware of that. But that was not God's plan. Amen. In Hebrews six, let's talk about the text of the evening. When God made His promise to Abraham, the writer says, "Because there was no one greater to swear by, He swore by Himself, saying, I will surely bless you.'" Hebrew, if you like, blessing, I will bless you. And I will give you many descendants. He kept his word, we know that. But the text goes ahead to say, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham inherited or received what was promised. Now verse 16, men, the text says, swear by someone greater than themselves, this is the rule of thumb. And the writer goes ahead to say in this version, that an oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Amen. Well, doesn't anymore, but it did then. I mean, the <laughs> times have changed in a whole lot of ways. Anyway, because, verse 17, God wanted to make the unchanging nature of His purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, God confirmed it with an oath. Amen. Now, God did this, the writer says, so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie... And then there's that interesting little personal pronoun, we. It's been third person up to this point. The heirs and Abraham and all of it. We who have fled to take hold of the hope that is offered to us may be greatly, strongly encouraged. This hope, the writer says, we have as an anchor for our soul. Firm and secure, safe and secure, a number of different ways to translate that text. And this hope enters, the, the writer says, in the inner sanctuary, yeah. behind the curtain, where Roy was <laughs> intended to go a minute ago, behind the curtain, where, the writer says, Jesus, who has already gone on our behalf, gone before us, has entered on our behalf. And he, the writer says, has become a high priest, I like this word, forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, now look at the little pink sheet, or a little, uh, I guess it's, it's uh, goldenrod's the name of this. Hebrews, already we know, is God's apologetic for every person that ever lived, including us, because we needed it. If you can imagine, and I know you can, back in the time when it was written, we had a divine religion. We called it Judaism. How are you going to argue against a divine religion? Well, you're going to have to have some strong medicine if you're going to do it. The Hebrew epistle, of course, is that. Well, now, as then, many religions abound, including Judaism. Uh, I, I shall never forget the fact that one year when I was teaching at Ozark and had in one of my classes a young man who was studying to be a preacher and in the middle of the first semester, he began to talk about Judaism. The old law and some things of that nature. And ere the first semester was over, the young man had actually given up Christianity, gone to Judaism, and dropped out of school. I'll never forget that. There wasn't anything any of us could do to talk him out of it. I thought, how sad. How sad. But that's the way she goes. First point, though, God's desire and intent for each one of us. So I thought about an anchor for the soul. I, I thought about something that, that keeps you where you are. That uh, performs in your life intellectually, uh, unlike physically, a, a place where you can stand and you're willing to stand regardless of the cost of standing there. 
Now, it isn't only in the religious realm that such things as this occur. We're here this evening because some men some 200 years ago vowed their sacred honor and a number of other things and signed their names to it. We're here tonight because they gave their lives to form a country, a more perfect union. Uh, I don't don't know how we'd have gone here if they hadn't decided to do that. And then, not very many years went past until a young lieutenant colonel by the name of William Barrett Travis on a February 26th of 1836 on a hot February afternoon in what we know as the Alamo sat down and wrote a letter to all Texans and all Americans everywhere. And in that letter, he told about, he could just look out to the west and see the little town called San Antonio de Bexar, that is San Antonio of the state of Bexar, with Santa Ana's troops over there, a thousand or more that he knew at the time, and he'd been shelled all day. And he, he wrote and said, he wrote in this, in this paper, that we, he said, need some reinforcements. We have been shelled. We can't get out of here. They have us surrounded. There are only about 150, some of us. Actually, there are about 187, I think, actually died or something like that. But as he wrote that in the short little note that he was going to send out by courier, Travis was a sort of a flamboyant fellow, I guess. But down in the middle of this, he wrote this little sentence. I will never surrender nor retreat. Now, he didn't say it. He just wrote it. But I can imagine had he said it, he would have said, I shall never surrender nor retreat. That's the way to say it. Because that was Travis. And down at the end of the letter, he said, victory or defeat, and underscored it three times. Signed his name. And then he wrote, P.S. The Lord is on our side. And he sent it by courier. No one answered that. And you know, on March the 6th, what happened in that fort to a man. I just, I just say that, not necessarily that it relates to salvation, but rather to say that men can be so committed to a cause, the rightness and the justness of a cause, that they will give their lives for it. That isn't news to any of you. But as you think about this anchor that the Hebrew writer talks about, how shall I respond to what God has done in my behalf? That was a little bit of what Travis was writing to the... He was hundreds of miles away from the border of what we knew, know as the United States. He was two weeks from New Orleans. He was a month from Washington. Where was the help? Well, he hoped it would come. It didn't come. Unlike those men at the Alamo, God's already done for us. That, that anchor. That anchor. And so on the first little point there, as you, as you look at your outline there, God's desire and intent as the Hebrew writer himself says, was something better for us. Something better for us. All the good things that had happened in 1,400 years, count Abraham, 2,100 years, all those good things, something better still. Coming. Something better coming. Well, of course, by the time the epistle was written, everybody knew what that was, but I I want you to think, if if you didn't know that, if you never heard of Calvary, if you never heard of Jerusalem, if you never heard of Jesus, what was the something better? Oh, well. I want you to think about planning. You've thought about that. I want you to think about privilege. I want you to think about what it means when God plans for you. Somebody. That's who you are. A sense of worth it gives you. God planned something better for Wallace and, and Colleen and all the rest of you. He planned for you individually. The text that we read this evening, catch some words. The writer, he says, about God wanted to make very clear so that even the man who runs can read it as the author. Even the man who runs by can read this. Big sign out there. Very clear to the heirs. Firm and secure. Amen. How long? Forever. That's the gist of the text aside from who Jesus is. That's what God did for us. Amen. That's what He did for me, as the song says. Amen. And, the, and the text already preached, 10, 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter into the... Confidence, that, that boldness, that I, that, I, that I could not have, that I did not find anywhere else. 
Next text down the line. What was God's intent? Well, Luke says to, to his friend Theophilus, many, I don't know how many that means, many, he says, have taken in hand. And he said, I have very carefully investigated and anticipated Sherlock Holmes 2,000 years. I have very carefully investigated so that you, Theophilus, may know the certainty of the things you have believed. God's intent and purpose was for us not to be shaken. John wrote it this way. Many other things, he said, could have been written, but these are written, he said, so that you, what? Believe. May believe. And that believing you may have life in His name. That the constant process of believing. Amen. I can't find any cessation of that in the Scriptures. I can't. I have to keep believing. It, it, it isn't, I grant you that it's by grace we're saved through faith. It's, I know those texts. But I can't get away from the believing part of it in John 20 and 31. My, my willingness to accept what God has done in my behalf. Paul said it in Romans chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. The Gospel of God which He promised beforehand in His prophets which He promised. It wasn't an accident, we know that. Regarding His Son who was declared with power. Or some put the phrase with power there. By the resurrection of the dead with power. But in any case, His Son is declared for our, on our behalf. For our confidence. For the kinds of things He wants out of us. The Hebrew writer said in chapter 2, this salvation, the Hebrew writer says, God also bore witness with. He, he mentions some things that men did. Well, men have done a lot of things. Crawl on their knees to Mecca. You name it. We don't have time for that. It's what God did that made the essential difference. The signs and the wonders and the gifts of the Spirit. God did that so that, so that we, we might know the certainty of what we believe. As Paul would say to a king, Agrippa, it was not done in a corner. Amen. It was not done where somebody can't find out about it. It was not done in secret. It was not done at night. It was done so that everybody who wants to know might know. And so he says to Agrippa, Agrippa, do you believe the promise? I know you believe Agrippa. And Agrippa said, ah. Well, I don't know what he said. I don't even know how to take that text. Maybe you don't either. But Paul knew. And he knew that Agrippa could know. That's what he also knew. He knew that. So the last little thought there in point number one. Jesus is God's yes for every restless soul. It is not yes and then no and then maybe. It is God's yes for every soul that's restless. Everyone that ever lived or will live. Jesus is God's yes. And in that, I take courage. Firm and secure. Oh, you can study Greek words. I like word studies, but let's just say that the two Greek words involved here are often used in legal documents of the day. I don't care to get into legality here, but they're just often used in legal documents of the day to tell the person or persons involved that what has been done, whether it be the purchase of land or the or some kind of a transaction in the judicial system, whatever, it's just a legal set of terms used to say you got it. Don't worry about it. You can go home sleep tonight. That's what those terms mean. Oh, you could talk about each one of them if you want to, but for instance, ospelace sort of means sure. It means unswerving. For instance, it doesn't get off the track. That is, um, not like the bumper car things at the circus, you know, when you hit this and you go off that. God, God's purpose, God's promise, God's anchor is not off the track. The, the, the other word, bebios, it, it was originally used to mean a foundation that you could walk on. But, but those things you can do for yourself. God's Word and God's promises, all those things are sure in His Son, or if you want to go up the other way, because of His Son, God's Word and God's promises are all sure. I don't, you, I don't care how you cut that little pie. Those things hang together. In Romans 4.16, I think Given mentioned that last night, that promise comes by faith, that it might be by grace, so that the promise might be to all of Abraham's seed, both those under the law and those who live by the faith of Abraham. 
But if it is by grace through faith, it is surely not of man and surely not of anyone but God. And that makes it sure. And so we're back to Hebrews chapter 6 again, aren't we? Amen. Romans 15 8, Paul says that Jesus became a servant to the Jews in order to confirm the promises God had made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles, ah, oh yes, praise his name, that includes us, so that the Gentiles might share. Amen. But, but Jesus is God's way of saying, look, I, I kept my word, and here it is, on a platter. Peter remarks, all men, he said, are like grass, like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers of the field fade, but he said God's word stands forever. And he said, that's what was preached to you people. To whomever he's writing, well, okay, that I expect could be applied to you and me. That's what was preached to us. That's why in the Hebrews 2 text, although there are lots of things done by men, it is God who bore signs and wonders and gifts of the Spirit that confirms the promises made to the fathers, which includes all of us. Point two in your list there. The things of life that come. I put down dangers of life. I don't know. I'm not much for titles or uh, something to talk about here. But if the anchor is there and in the boat, what would keep us from throwing it overboard and using it? Or having thrown it overboard to cut the rope? What would cause us to do that? Oh, in the Acts account of Paul, it says in chapter 27 that they boarded a ship, you may recall, and headed her out, but the weather got bad, and so they tried to park the thing, if you please. But the majority, here's the majority rule for you, I don't know if this is always good, but the majority rule said, we can do it. And the text says in verse 13 that they weighed anchor and set sail. Well, it went good for a little while, you may recall. But then the northeaster came. Oh, my. And in verse 20, Paul writes, he said, we finally, he said, gave up all hope that we would be saved. We just gave it up. Max Frankel, who endured Auschwitz, some prison by the Germans and sent there uh, talking about giving up hope. <clears throat> he said when he was arrested, he was like millions of others, put on a train and told that they were going to be taken to a place to work. And so they were kind of, uh, oh, optimistic, if you please. Got on a train, too many of them on there down the tracks they went through the nights and three or four days and finally they, they knew they were off on a siding and he said somebody was able to see it, that they were up they were, they were stacked up so high in the cars that they could, they could just kind of you'll have to excuse this mic here they had to get down like that to look out the window and see where they were and there was that one word Auschwitz Talk about a sinking feeling. <clears throat> Herded them all off and got them into a big, about 1,500 of them, he said, into a room that was about this size that would hold 200. He said, handily, but 1,500 kind of squeezed them a bit. He said, kept them there overnight. And the next day, they, they let them out the doors, the guards did, and there was this German soldier standing there like this with this little finger. And the guards kept him falling right toward him and he'd go as the people came by, men and women. Well, of course, Victor Frankl got this one, which meant you lived past today. Those that got the left one, that was nine out of every ten, didn't live past that day. In fact, the matter, Frankl said that when he got into the prison late that evening, that one of his friends was not with him and he asked one of the other inmates who was there, he asked about this gentleman and the gentleman said, well, which way did he go, left or right? And Frankel said he went left and the man said, well, turn around and look right up there. 
And he pointed out to a smokestack about 300 yards away and he said, you will see him going up. That's where your friend is. But he said, there was still that despair of hope. And he said they were herded into these places and, and he only tells this, actually he wrote the whole book, Man's Search for Meaning, to, to say, in effect, if there's a why, it outweighs any how. Which is, of course, the point of this illustration. Nietzsche said, many years ago, that if there's a why, you can bear with almost any how. But Frankel went on to improve on it. And so he said, when they got into the, into the, into the guard room and went through all this process, that, that the guards were very nice, and they had them all go into the room, separated men from women, and made them disrobe, uh, except their shoes and, and a belt. And if they had a truss on, if they had a hernia or something, they could keep the truss. That was it. No rings, no watches, no... And their glasses, if they had glasses. He said, while we were waiting for this to happen, he said, I, I came across this old man who had been there a while, and, and he said, I had on a coat, and he said, I had a manuscript sewn in the lining of this coat. And he, he, he kind of skittled over to this old man, and he said, this is my life's work, and I know it ought to be grateful that I'm not dead, but he said, I, I'd like to say this manuscript. He said the man looked him straight in the eye for a little bit and then just kind of straightened up. And then he said he first kind of began to smile. And then he said he smirked. And then he just uttered a four-letter expletive. That's all he said. And turned and walked off. And he said it was then that I understood that there was no hope of saving the manuscript or of saving my life. That hope was gone. He said, when you first lose hope, he said, shock sets in and you begin to think sort of curiously, well, what's going to happen now? Hope is gone. What happens now? He said, you can learn to live with that. There are ways to do that. Now then consider Paul and those fellows on that ship. We finally decided there was no hope how do we get there in the religious life? I just gave you four little ideas down to there right quick. I think ignorance of God's Word is one of them. It's one of the reasons I admire, if I may use this term, I admire this refreshing waters thing. Now, I could have said I like it or a lot of other things. I admire it. I had a, had a group of people from Granola go to Jamaica two weeks ago. Six of them went down to stay for ten days to help a missionary down there. And he said, and the thing that they all testified to almost immediately when they came back was that those Jamaican children, I didn't say adults, those Jamaican children knew the scripture. They quoted it. They quoted it, the men quoted it, the women quoted it, and the children quoted it. They knew it. And by implication, the people in Granola fell short. <clears throat> What does ignorance of the scriptures bring you? Well, on your text there, I just mentioned two things. Sadducees and Satan. The Sadducees, you may recall, came to Jesus with a question about death and marriage and the life hereafter. I suspect it was a carefully crafted question asked of many Pharisees who had no very good answer to it. And they posed it to Jesus, the teacher, the rabbi from Nazareth. And Jesus just responded. He said, you are ignorant of God's Word and the God behind the Word. You're ignorant of both of those things. Now may I suggest to you this evening that oftentimes our weakness, our inability to appreciate the anchor that God has given is because of our ignorance of what He said about it. Which is one of the reasons I like this sort of a thing. Amen. Amen. First thing that Satan is quoted saying, has God said? But Eve knew, didn't she? She said, God has said. Oh, if she had practiced what she preached. But she knew it. Sometimes in amongst us, people, I, I see it in articles and I hear it now and then, 
arguing about doctrine. Well, doctrine is the same Greek word as teaching. So it's the same line. They say doctrine divides us. True enough. It divided Jesus from the Sadducees. It sure did. Amen. It sure did do that. And it divided Jesus from a lot of other people too. In fact, it divided him from the Pharisees. And he asked them, he said, he said, how are you going to escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. How are you going to escape that? It was a dividing thing. But doctrine unites as well. It has both those characteristics. It can put people together. Amen. It can make people give their lives for things. Amen. It can make people say and do what they never ever thought they would say and do before. And you say, well, W.W., <laughs> what's, what's new about that? Oh, nothing and everything. One of these, one of the couples that went down to Jamaica, I thought I knew them reasonably well. I've known them at least for eight years past and actually have known, uh, actually have known them since they were little bit of kids. But the husband and wife went down there and began to work. Uh, the husband's testimony about his wife was in the work down on the field, he said, I had to take my wife to Jamaica to discover what she would say and do. You see, when you, when you get yourself in a certain set of circumstances, you may say and do things you never ever expected yourself to say and do. And I'm talking about in a good sense and for Jesus. What I'm talking about. Let me suggest for you that this young lady Oh, hell. <laughs> She's 40, but that's okay. I can say young, I guess. This young lady uh, has kind of blonde hair. Uh, I was trying to think, uh, do, uh, I don't want to pick out any ladies here, but she has reasonably blonde hair. It's kind of short. Most of the Jamaican people, of course, are not quite as blonde or fair as she. And one of the things that she did to please them was to go sit down in a chair and let those little Jamaican kids run their hands through her hair. Every day, they had never seen anything like that. Why was she down there? Oh, it's because she loved the Lord enough to decide she'd go. Oh, it wasn't a big thing, I guess. Except I never had anyone run their hands through my hair. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd want them to. But the point of all this discussion is that her commitment and her conviction about what she'd ought to do for the Lord caused her to say and do things that she would never ever have done in Granola, Kansas. But I want you to think about how you relate to this anchor. Point two, refusal to believe it, a matter of the will. That was, of course, Eve's problem, and later her husband, Adam's. Let me suggest for you this evening that obedience is, is simply another term for practiced faith. Is that what I do day in and day out? Obedience is a learned thing. It does not come naturally in, in God's sphere, at least in my understanding. It is a state of mind that I practice, that I have to keep practicing, and I have to work on. Maybe you're not like I am. Maybe you're different from me. I don't know. But I have to work on this practicing my faith in the sense of obedience. Oh, but sometimes you say, well, W.W., how can I do that? Let me ask you this. Did you go past any stop signs on the way over here? And if you did, what did you fail to practice? Obedience. How do you learn to be obedient? You practice it. Do you not? If you cannot practice in such a simple matter as stopping at a stop sign, how are you going to practice what God wants us to do? And the answer is you probably won't. You will probably slide right on by just like you did the stop sign and the speed limits. You see, obedience is a something that, that we put inside and then we express it outside. You have an assignment from the teacher. What do you do? You do it. Practicing obedience is like practicing the presence of God, isn't it? And the answer is you do that every day. You practice the presence of God every day. That's practicing obedience. That's putting my faith into action. 
the practice of presence of God in my life. Have you ever gone by yourself on a trip somewhere? The answer probably is yes. Have you ever taken anyone else with you to the same place? And if the answer to that be yes, I think I can win some money that you didn't do the same thing on the second trip you did on the first because you had someone with you. And you thought about them. You considered them. If you didn't, you were a heel. But in any case, I want you to think about practicing the presence of someone being with you and what the difference it makes in your life. And if I think I have God along with me, it makes a difference in what I do. Amen. Point three, lukewarmness. <clears throat> lukewarmness is just another way to say I have no commitment. Lukewarmness, I don't know what it could come from. Ignorance maybe, or indifference, or a lot of things. But Jesus talks about a man who went out to sow, and he sowed seed here and there and yon. You're calling Luke 8, and he said in verse 14, describing the third kinds of seed, the seed that sprouted, he said, and this seed, he said, the what sprouted and grew, he said, was, was choked out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And he said it didn't bear fruit. Well, why? How could one get choked? You've been choked. You ever had someone throw you down, put their arm around you? You ever had somebody do that? Did you like it? Would you have let it happen if you? Uh, yeah. When I was a little bitty boy, I had some big uncles, and they they grab me by the throat and go. Everybody. Do that. I never liked that. <laughs> but it doesn't matter God do about it, they're bigger than I was. <laughs> what I want you to think about is choked by how did how did I how did they even get that close? Choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and therefore they did not bear fruit. I was indifferent to the approach, or I was indifferent, or I don't know what I was. Martha was not going to enjoy what Mary was going to enjoy because Jesus said you're distracted by many things, but it was Mary's attention that was divided. No. No. It was Martha's attention that was first here and then there, and she couldn't get it anywhere. Really. So he says to her, well, Mary's chosen the best thing. Paul talks about children tossed to and fro. He said, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the cunning craftiness of men. Well, there are a lot of different ways to translate that text. But the thrust of the matter is, don't be like children. How shall I not be like a child? Not degrading the children, but how shall I grow up? Oh, well, I shall do a lot of things, but one of those is, I shall quit being lukewarm about a lot of things. I'm going to have to get myself into gear. Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 2. He said, not everyone, he said, has faith. That's one of the first things to recognize everybody thinks alike. And because that is true, I may then be taken in by this one or that one or something else. And pretty soon I am not where I ought to be. I, I'm just drifting one way or the other. And I'm not really sure where I am. I have a among the folk at Grace, the place where I preach over there, have a young lady who is Catholic by background. But she has he's, she's given up on that. She told me herself, she said, that is out of my life. But she has not, and I asked her this question because I then figured out where she was. I said, called her my name. I said, well, where is your authority? And she was quite a little bit, and I said, you really don't have any, do you? She said, no, I don't. She hasn't discovered one yet. She's given up that authority that she grew up under. Now she's just drifting. She's not quite sure where she is, and so therefore she does nothing. I can't get her to do anything, if you excuse that expression. Uh, she will not do anything. She's, uh, mm, she's drifting. Maybe, maybe later on. I don't know. But oftentimes our uh, unwillingness to believe God's Word or commit ourselves to it brings about this little thought, this, this drifting business. I, I, I'm not sure what to do about it. There are other ways maybe to drift. By the way, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 says we ought to give the more careful attention to the things we've heard lest what? We drift 
from them. So drifting's already come up before the anchor ever was thrown out. Already the problem of drifting. Let me suggest a couple of things for you or three right quick. One, all of us struggle with this. We have memorized verses since we were little kids, some of us have. We quote them. It's this word baptism. I doubt not that all of you here could tell me what it means. But let me suggest for you that this little lady of whom I spoke and most other Catholics like her, and if you would bring them in and read that sign up there to them, they would say, what? I have obeyed Scripture. Baptism doesn't mean anything, necessarily. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, we say. Well, meaning's in the eye of the reader. How hard would it be, do you think, for any of us to change our language and so that every time we read the word B-A-P-T-I, so in the scripture, to read immersion instead, which we know is what it's talking about, would it, would it just uh, tear your vocal cords out, you think? I mean, would it, would it hurt your eyes? Does it make any difference? Well, it does to her because she thinks she's obedient. And uh, uh, Rick, uh, I believe, uh, grew up as a Catholic, probably he would testify the same thing. You see, it does make a difference. We, we really do believe what we say, folks. Well, you say, well, WWI, I know what that means. Oh, yes, but many others don't. Wouldn't it be nice if we could write the standard and say, would you please put immersion in there? It doesn't take any more ink. It isn't any, hard, it isn't any harder to print. And, and instead of every week, so many bad weeks, stay immersions, that'd be very, that'd be sure, sure, plain. In fact, I've got so many more. I don't, I told you last I don't baptize them, but I immerse a number of people. They just a couple weeks back. One of the reasons I want to be plain with what I say. Well, you say maybe you are. I, I'm not arguing with you necessarily, but I want you to think words do make a difference. If they don't, then let's erase Jesus and put Mohammed in there if words don't make a difference. They do make a difference in what we say and what people here say. Let me give you another one. How about the word church? Over where I preach, we're thinking about building uh, onto the building that is there. Some of the people are already saying what? They're going to tear up the what? Huh. We have no intention of doing that. Could you change? I'll tell you this. I have a 13-year-old grandson who's a Jehovah's Witness. He beats us 100 miles to nowhere. When he comes to my house, he talks about going to the meeting house. He talks about going to the assembly. He never talks about going to church. And he's ahead of his granddad. And most of the people whom his granddad preaches because he's got it at least straight. The church the people. We're not going to tear up anything. Church over there, we're not Change the building, maybe. You say, does it make a difference? Let me ask you this. There's a headline in today's paper, another church burnt down. Really? Hmm. Friends and neighbors does make a difference. If we're going to change, if we intend by this meeting to do something more than just take up three days, may I suggest we start with some of the essentials, the things we really do believe, that it is immersion that makes a difference. That it is the church that includes the people. You say, how hard would that be? Oh, I don't know. <clears throat> Pretty hard. Maybe. It does make a difference. You say, well, that's what the Bible says. Say, friends, I'm not a slave to any translation. I don't bow down to King James the sixth or the first, depending on which one you talk about, because 400 and almost 500 years ago now, he told his translators, I want you to use the old ecclesiastic words, including baptism, church. I don't bow down to King James. He's not my king. You say, well, WW, I don't read Greek or Hebrew. Oh, you don't have to. All of you know that. You know just as well as I do. Let me give you another one. How about the word Pastor. Our movement is going out to pasture, sort of, <clears throat> by a whole lot of people who ought to know a whole lot better. I'm not saying the word couldn't be applied to preachers, I'm not arguing that point, but as a general rule of thumb, 
you know the word does not apply to a fellow called a preacher. Can be. James 1, Pornicus, and others. What difference does it make? Oh, just to be honest and true with what God wrote to me. That's the difference that I see that it makes. Being plain honest with God's Word. You see, if God has said it, maybe I ought to believe it. Well, I don't know. Point four right quick. How about misplaced love? Ha- having to do with the direction. John says in 1 John 2, Do not love this world or anything in this world, for all is in the world and you finish the rest of the quote. Let me ask you this. Have you ever said... Well, maybe I better not start that way. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Have you ever had a dog? Or a cat? Okay. Now the question. Have you ever said, I love that dog? And if you have, is that what John's talking about? Don't love this world or anything that is in this world? Well, where's the dog in that expression? Have you ever said, I love good food? Where is that in 1 John 2? Have you ever said, I love baseball, I love sports? Where is that in 1 John 2? I'll tell you where it is. It's one of the things that's going to perish. The city of Winfield has been standing on its ear for the last two weeks because some poor man over there uh, normally has his dog on the back of his truck and, and for some reason he, he lost the rope that he normally puts around the dog and he used the little log chain to, to keep the dog on there and the dog accidentally fell off and, and the man was dragging the dog through the city streets of Winfield. You would have thought they'd killed all the people in town because that poor man was dragging that dog. He didn't intend to drag the dog and he said he didn't. Uh, and people who knew him testified to that. He didn't hate that dog. The PETA people, the people for the ethical treatment of animals, have so inculcated their doctrine into the lives of American people that dogs are on a par with people now, if not above. There are people robbed and, and, and hurt and maimed in Winfield every day, and the police let it go by. But you catch a dog being dragged through town, and you think heaven had fallen down. You see, the, the things that we get shoved into. It's misplaced direction. Amen. Paul talks about people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You say, well, I know that text, W.W. Okay, let me give you this one. How about 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10? A fellow by the name of Demas, what did he do? He loved this present world and he deserted me. How do you get from here to there? Demas was a good worker because he began, I think, to decide I can love everything, and you can't do that. No man can serve two masters. Jesus said, either love the one and hate the other, despise one and You cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. And Demas couldn't do it. And he left Paul. How do I get where Demas is? By loving this present world. That's how I do it. Amen. I better be careful what I love. Amen. June was talking this, uh, this afternoon, I guess, and so was her husband, about loving the truth. Well, say, I can love something besides the truth. Jeremiah talks about, in his day, he said, a horrible and shocking thing, he said, has happened in the land. He said, the prophets prophesy falsehood. The priests rule by their own authority. And then he said, my people love it. I know the rest of that quote, but I want it to end right there. My people love it. Well, you know what happened to the Jewish nation because they loved the wrong things. That's right. Now they did. Last thought. How do I receive what God so graciously, freely promised? An anchor for my soul. I think a lot of ways. One, I think Jesus said it Himself. I must totally commit what I am and who I am, whatever that is, to Him. I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't even think that's legalism. I just think that's what He wanted out of me. Some men came to him in Luke chapter 9 and said, Lord, we'll follow you and you know that text. And then he finally summed it all up and he said, anyone, he said, who puts his hand to the plow and keeps looking back, anyone who does that is not fit 
for the kingdom. Anyone who does that is not fit for the kingdom. If I'm going to serve God, I must have no divided mind. I must not be unstable in my ways, which is what James says I will be if I have a divided mind. State a little different. He says you're unstable in all your ways. It just simply means I, I, any affair in my life that comes to mind, if, my, if, if I cannot get my will in line with God, almost anything is then up for grabs. Is that not the case? Amen. If I'm not totally committed to God, anything is up for grabs. Oh, it may not be today, but it'll be tomorrow. Satan will find it out. WW is not committed over here. And then he's not committed over there. And that's where he's going to try me. The un, undivided mind. The committed mind is an admirable thing. Especially if it is set on Jesus. I, I just want us to think about those lines. I don't have to have a great mind. I don't have to have a brilliant mind. I just have to have it committed to God. So that's all I have to do. Amen. I don't see why that's so hard, but it is hard. Then I need to love the truth, and that was what these two people very well said. So I'm not going to work on that whole lot, but I want you to think along these lines. Our movement began in a great way in many respects, and as I study those men way back when. And, and the ensuing years of history, of, of, their, of their decision to know the difference between human wisdom and divine revelation, and how they worked on that over the years, trying to make sure that they understood the difference in those two things, and practiced them as well. Divine revelation, of course, is what God has said. Human wisdom is what we think about what God said. I, that's, I just say it just for the sake of discussion here. Let me give you an illustration or two. Have you read an article or ever heard anybody say that agape love is God's kind of love and phileo love is not? Have you ever heard anybody say that? You know, I can't find any scripture for that. Amen. And I've looked a whole long time. There isn't one verse that says agape love is God's kind of love and philia, or however you want, or which, whichever form you want, verb or noun, whatever, is, is not God's kind of love. The man that Jesus loved, his name was Lazarus, is not described with the God faith. So, I guess Jesus didn't care much about him. He wept and, at his grave and went on to go. But I guess he really didn't care about poor old Lazarus. We're speaking where God has not spoken. We're saying what God has not said. Jesus loved the disciples. God loved him. All that's philia. That let's be careful of saying what God has not. I'm sure he could have said, Well, this is my kind of love, and so you practice this and don't you do that because you see that's that's down. He never ever stored a in there too. Lovers of good, Paul says. That, that's a compliment. It's what you ought to be, it's what I'd ought to be. It's neither one of those words, but it's there just the same. It's the kind of person I ought to be. What God said. Not what I might have thought him to say. If I love the truth, it cannot be. Uh, Hegel says this was disavowed this, but he gets credit for it. I must love the truth not in the Hegelian sense of, of a never-ending search for an ever-changing absolute where the fun is in the search and not in the find. It, it is not that sort of truth that I must look for. It is not that sort of mindset that I must have. It is the kind of mindset that God has spoken and I will do my best to find it. And when I get there, I will commit myself totally to Him and let Him speak and I shall obey. That's what I shall do. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, and somebody quoted this just this afternoon, that people perished, he said, because they refused to love the truth. Just refuse to love the truth. That's 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. They refused. They perished. Didn't have to. The ship was out to sea. It had been gone for two weeks. They'd given up all hope. But God stood by Paul. And he came to the men in Acts 27 verse 25. And he said, men. He said, God stood by me, an angel. God stood by me this night. And he said, you know the rest of the text. And then this little verse out of King James. Sirs, I believe God. 
Amen. And it was as Paul believed, just as God said. And the souls, all of them were saved. All 276 souls were saved on that ship because God could do it. And Paul believed him. Or they wanted to kill some of you, remember, do this. And Paul said, now if you do that, we can't be saved. Okay. Believing God. Practicing what I preach. Last little thought, stand on the promises, just practice faith. The Hebrew writer says, don't throw away your confidence. Amen. Why would you think about throwing it away? Oh, who can tell why you think about throwing it away? Demas threw it away. Judas threw it away. Thousands of others have thrown it away. I guess probably I might not be excluded from that group either. Jude writes in verse 21, he said, you keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the appearing of Jesus. You keep yourself there. Amen. Stay the course. Amen. Stay with the hope. You know, I, I might or might not, <laughs> I, I guess in some ways I do, in some ways I don't, uh, think about the Reformers. I'm not sure sometimes what I think, but I cannot help but admire the famous statement of Luther. Here I stand. God help me. I can do no other. I know his faith is imperfect. I know his doctrine wasn't the best. But I know he felt in his heart that where he stood was where he ought to stand. And there wasn't any place else worth standing except where he stood. And so he stood there. It cost him. Oh, I, I know the rest of that story may be about as well as some of the rest of you, but I want you to think that here is a man who had read himself out of one position and into another and thought he was going right, I think probably was. Sure was a better direction where he'd been headed, that's for sure. I, I can't do anything else but this. Two years ago, I had the privilege of going uh, to, among other places, uh, Oxford, England, I'd often, I never really wanted to go to what we know as the uh, promised land or Palestine or whatever you call it. Never really ever wanted to go. I had a chance to go really. I've had several chances. Really never ever wanted to go, but I did want to go to Europe and I did want to go to England. And by the Lord's grace, I got to do both of those. The reason I tell you that, just, I, I went up to Oxford, England one day. I was walking down the street, kind of a broad street, and down ahead of me, I could see it, uh, the, the, it was, the, the street kind of did a little curve thing. I could see the buildings down through there. And, and there, were, there was a kind of a, off to my left and down ahead of me, there's kind of a white statue that is standing, oh, pretty tall, I don't know, 30 foot, I suppose, up, and there were some students sitting on it. And as I made progress down the street, I was just, you know, wide-eyed wonder, child in wonderland. But pretty soon I could hear this voice. And I thought to myself, well, that sounds like somebody preaching. Or something like that, at least. And so I kept progressing, and I could see then pretty soon that there was three fellows in white shirts standing over by the street corner, the street sign by that statue, one of the statues, it is a, I don't know what, <laughs> something over there. Monuments, what it really was. And I could see this guy was preaching, and he had a good voice. And I stood there and listened a while to this fellow preaching. And the students weren't paying much attention. They were as close as, I mean, they're all around him, lounging around. They weren't paying, but he was out there with his Bible, man, he was just laying it on them, giving them promises and talking about Jesus and how they could be saved and all that sort of thing. And after he got done, I walked across the street with the light and introduced myself. I thought, my goodness, in Oxford, England, I ought to get acquainted with these guys. And they were, they were ministers of a kind of an evangelical congregation there in the town of Oxford. City, I guess, town probably in Salem. The city of Oxford. And we talked a little about, bit about the work and, and then we parted company and I turned around uh, to them and walked on in, in, in this direction south and just immediately behind me was a little cemetery. And then it dawned on me after I read the little sign there that this cemetery and this monument was built in honor of some people, mostly men, but some women there who had given their lives under the reign of the lady we know as Bloody Mary. Queen of England. She became queen in 1553 and because of a number of things actually died in 1558 but during those five years time a great number of people were put to death because of uh, the people that she had put in for instance the Archbishop of uh, 
of uh, Canterbury, who's the head of the Church of England and others like that, very much uh, pro-Rome, anti-Protestant. And among the men that she had in prison were two bishops originally out of the church who had become Protestants, Ridley and Latimer. And those two men, along with a fellow named Thomas Cranmer, who had been uh, her spiritual counselor and some other things, had been in prison there in Oxford for quite a good long time. And on this particular day, October the 16th, 19, uh, 1855, it was Ridley and, Cranmer's uh, Ridley and Latimer's turn to die. So they let him out of prison and took him down there. And, and the text says that, account of the thing says that they both knelt down together and prayed and then they stood up and they bound him to a common post with a chain around their waist. And one of the men said, pull her tight. They piled, of course, the wood around the, the man's feet and put a lighted thing around right down at the bottom of Ridley's feet. And Latimer turns to him as much as he can and says in these rather famous words, Be of good cheer, Ridley. Play the man. We shall today, by God's grace, light up a candle which all of England can't put out. And they died. Now, I am not here to say just how faithful they might or might not have been to some of the things we deem quite important. But I do know this. They thought in Jesus. They had an anchor for their soul and they would give their life for it in public. It didn't make any difference how much it cost. There I stand like Martin Luther. I can do no other. And they died. It may be that your life isn't quite what it ought to be, or I don't know about your life. I put a little quote down there out of Jeremiah. You might have thought that a funny quote. But as I look at Jeremiah chapter 6, in Jeremiah's day, you very well know that most of Israel was going to hell in a handbasket pretty fast. It's all but over. And Jeremiah says to them, God speaking through him, ask for the old paths. Ask for the good way. Amen. And walk in it. And you'll find rest for your souls. Now, granted, he was talking about what has long since departed. But the thrust of the man's expression was, get right with God and stay there. Now, I think that same thing is apropos for all of us in this building this evening. Amen. We need to get right with God and we need to stay there lest we drift to and fro Amen. or lest we lose the anchor that God has so graciously, freely provided. To argue otherwise is to make the anchor of none effect to say either we can't lose it or we can't get it is, is to render all that we're doing foolish. That's right. But we can start and we can finish. We can be once in grace, always in grace, if we so desire to do that. Rooted in, built on, Jesus the rock that cannot be moved. Pick up that little sheet if you're looking at the back of it. And that's saying drifting. This song was written many, many years ago. I don't know who Eliza Hewitt was. But I've, I've often thought about this song. Most of the time people don't get lost all at once. They get lost by degrees. No puns intended here for college people. They just do it. And I want, uh, George, you can sing whatever verses you want here, maybe one and four, but I want you to think about the anchor that God's provided and what you can do to hang on to it. George? Tassie, would you play it? Listen to the melody here. <laughs> <laughs> 